Now, I'm sure you have uh, lots of questions to ask, um, so may I please uh, open the floor um, and fire away. First question, uh, uh, Paul Leonard, please. First of all, can I just say thanks for two excellent presentations. I came here today and uh, wondered if I did the right thing coming all the way here for one day, but I'm, I always do, already feel it was worthwhile. Um, for those of us who live in Brussels, um, I, I guess you won't be surprised to hear that the dominant thinking in Brussels is that uh, conventional agriculture is bad for biodiversity and organic is good. And we see that uh, emerging in legislation. So for example, uh, and thanks to Angel and Martin for bringing that to our attention, uh, even in the parliament now, uh, there is a draft uh, paper on uh, biodiversity and, and sustainable agriculture, which specifically talks about small scale farming and organic farming and encourages uh, policy makers to have policies and the CAP to support this model of biodiversity. Nowhere in there does it say that we need to have sustainable intensive production for biodiversity. And there's a big difference between the story we hear this morning and what we see playing out at policy level in Brussels. Um, and recently I had the opportunity to meet with somebody uh, under Chatham House rules, so I can't explain who it was or even which organization they came from, but it was somebody who should know all about these things. And I got the impression there that whilst there is a realization uh, in certain parts of the commission that this is the case, uh, the response was society has chosen the sort of agriculture it wants. And there's a sort of uh, almost a f fate that, has, it, that you can see playing out now in CAP. And I wanted to ask two questions. What is it that we can do to make this work that you're doing more understandable by policymakers, because it's critical to do it now. And uh, the other thing is, how can we engage more with society to help society understand in a positive way that although organic has many good elements, um, this is not a simplistic solution to our problems? I fully agree with your assessment of the situation that I think the societal understanding of these issues is probably 10 years behind where the science is, and policymakers' understanding of these issues is probably four or five years behind where the science is. So the key thing is that if you go out onto an organic farm and look at what's happening on that organic farm, you often get a positive impression of the environment. The key thing then is to, ex to acknowledge that if the, that farm is not producing food, then that's just passing the buck off to somebody else. And we have only recently been doing this in terms of thinking about it in the science, so it's not really surprising in a way, because that's quite a nuanced argument that if we stop producing food in Europe because we're going very, very touchy-feely organic, then somebody else is having to be uh, intensively product productive. So in terms of leading the societal debate, most people who buy organic are buying it partly for health reasons, but partly for environmental reasons. If they were better informed that organic food has an environmental cost elsewhere in the world, then I think you know, that's partly our responsibility as academics, but it's partly everybody's responsibility who knows these arguments to try and make some of those, 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 those arguments. And it's the same with GM. If, when I have conversations with people, I say, do nothing with GM is carrying an environmental cost because all that means is more land will be used more intensively in other parts of the world. So we have to balance the benefits against the costs and it's the same with organic. Organic is not a panacea. Organic does make your local biodiversity better but if that comes at a cost of biodiversity in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of the number of species that are affected, the, the overall environmental cost, it would be much greater in Africa. So, you know, we have to give that choice in our marketing of these issues to the consumer and say, it's not simple, it's not straightforward. You know, and the same applies to food miles. People like buying locally because they think it's green, whereas actually often it's much more sensible, lower input to buy something that's imported from the tropics because the production costs are often lower in terms of you know, energy. You don't have to heat greenhouses. And so what we have to do is find ways of articulating the argument that people can latch onto and understand 
And, you know, I think that's the responsibility of everybody who can see their way through these things. So that was the first question, in a way. What was the first question? What was the, the other one was about engaging with society. Yeah. Can we do it better? So, so, I mean, you know, in a sense, that's why I'm here. Um, I think in terms of you talking to your constituencies, it's a relatively simple argument that if there is a global demand for food, the food has got to go, come, come from somewhere. And if you reduce it in one part of the world, then somewhere else has to increase it. And that increase comes with a cost. So you can't just look at the benefits in the place where you're reducing the yield without addressing the costs where you're increasing the yield. And so, you know, in a sense, that's, that's quite straightforward to, to articulate. Another question, please. Yes, Dominic. Uh, Dominic Dyer, UK Crop Protection Association. Two very good presentations, and I think have given us some really interesting issues to, to think over. Just one general point for, for both speakers and as to where, where you respond on this, but it strikes me the debate on biodiversity is, is, is very much based upon the need almost to return to what we once had in the sense that if we went through rapid industrialization and farming and food production and urban sprawl in the 1940s and beyond, we did lose biodiversity across Europe. And we've lost it in many other parts of the world as well. But it just strikes me that we're not being honest with people because we can't return to what we had. And a lot of what we're talking about is, is managing, as you're saying, the margins of land or nature reserves and other areas in an effective way to maintain effective crop production, but at the same time try and maybe target the return of certain species, look at where maybe we've got some species coming in that are having a negative impact, like you talked about rooks and magpies and things. Um, we're not hearing that debate enough in policy circles. It, it worries me that people who sort of look at reports of declining birds think, my God, what are we going to do? We've just got to get it all back again. Um, do we need a more honest assessment in your mind of what we can actually achieve, you know, when compared to the need to grow food? It's absolutely critical, of course. So I can agree. The selection, for example, of birds for the European Farmland Bird Index exactly reflects what you're saying. These are birds that our birds of the past, and there's not a single bird. When I drive to intensively managed landscapes, I, there are birds, but not a single of these birds are reflected in the farmland bird index. As uh, Tim said, it's uh, the corvids, also other certain finches, and so this um, lobby is to do for, or just to, you know, to inform the public about this dynamism of agricultural lands. And coming back to the, the question before, a lot of people, or it's increasingly popular to travel around the world and to observe wildlife, to travel to the Brazilian Amazon and to enjoy all the macaws and the parrots and the, and the birds there, and not being aware that the soybean fields needed to feed European pigs and cows and whatever destroy exactly this, this, what we are paying for to see it. So there should be a link, it's just a matter of lobbying. I think the most straightforward res response to that is that the world has moved and climate change means that we can never get back. So actually, if you look in any one part of the world, the historical what lived there and what can live there now and what will live there in 40 years' time are going to be very, very different. So it is, it's acknowledging that the world is changing. Some of it's our fault and some of it's just natural change. Acknowledging the world changing, there is no going back. You know, it's artificial to say, let's recover the 1940s or the 1960s. It is what can we do where we are now, looking ahead in terms of maintaining the things that are economically valuable. You know, that's the bottom line, I think. Okay, another question, please. Yeah, Jacques Dupuis from Biocrop Science. Uh, maybe two points. Uh, the one uh, which was on the comparison in Brazil between the forest and, and the soybean. Uh, in a sense, what the Brazilians say is that not converting uh, forest into soybean, but grassland into soybean. So it may be more relevant to have the comparison between these two uh, situations regarding uh, biodiversity. Um, and the second, uh, the second question is, we have this very interesting comparison between organic farming and, and, uh, and classic farming. What would be also quite interesting is to have um, information on uh, uh, what you said at the end, uh, Professor Benton, uh, the uh, difference of biodiversity between classic uh, agriculture and an agriculture which includes all the field margin managements and the biodiversity as you suggested at the end. Do you have any data that prove uh, that then uh, you can increase biodiversity in these such uh, systems? We don't have any data directly to answer your question, but most organisms live in the margins. Um, there is a lot of research 